السلام علیکم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد اللہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام علی خیر المرسلین محمد النبی الامی وعلى آلہ وصحب اجمعین سبحانک لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انک انت العلیم الحکیم رب شرح لی صدری ویسر لی امری وحل لقتا من لیسانی یفقہ قولی I wanted to start by saying that it's an honor to be here with all of you again at the Mass ICNA convention in Chicago. It's actually been two years since the last time I came. And yes, I am, alhamdulillah, a mother now uh, of a little one and a half year old that I left behind in California. And so I ask all of you to please keep him in your du'as, uh, a nervous mother, you know, leaving her, uh, her baby behind to be with all of you. And yet, it's, uh, I'm very pleased to be here and it's an honor. So the topic that we have actually for the entire convention and for my session, I think is very important. It's going back to the basics. The moral compass, what are the components of the moral compass that we have? And when you think about a compass, a compass points you in a particular direction. So that begs the question, فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ Where are you going? Where are we going? And what does it really mean when we say 17 times a day in prayer, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Asking Allah, begging Allah to guide us upon the straight path. I want us to take a look at this dua. Once I was asked the question, if you could you know, teach a child just one verse of the Qur'an, which verse would it be? What would, it, what would your favorite verse be? And I said this one. Because this verse summarizes the essence of our compass. When you look at this verse, we recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We recognize Him as the source of our guidance. We recognize that guidance is a process and we recognize that there is a path that we are supposed to walk. In the words of one of my teachers in Egypt, Dr. Taha Jabir al-Alwani, he said, the Qur'an has three major themes, Tawheed, Tazkiyah, and Umran. Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, actualizing the oneness of Allah in our lives. Tazkiyah, which is the purification that, we, that that is supposed to lead to, and Umran, which is civilization building. These three themes constitute what we are supposed to do, what we are supposed to be involved in. It's part of our direction. And you may ask about Tawheed. You know, all of us believe that there is only one God. Why, why are we bringing this up? Because do we really believe in this? SubhanAllah, each one of these themes is predicated on the one before it. So if we have problems in our civilization, that is a reflection of problems in our Tazkiyah. If we have problems in our Tazkiyah, that's a reflection in problems in our Tawheed and our belief. So it's really important to get the core right and then to build upon it. It's really important for us to realize that la ilaha illallah is not a descriptive statement. It's not just descriptive. We're not saying that there is only one uh, God, but uh, there's, there's no other Lord except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're saying much more than that. We're saying so much more than that if we could really actualize what Tawheed is. As some of our teachers have taught us, what is the difference between believers and the shaitan? The shaitan already knows without a doubt that there is only one God. The shaitan knows this possibly better than we do. That there is only one God. But Allah is not his goal. La ilaha illallah means Allah is our goal. It means Allah is our motivator. It means that when we do something, the transaction with all of creation is not with what we see, but is with the unseen, it is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what Tawheed essentially means, is that we are living for Him. When you want to answer the question, who is Allah? Get to know His beautiful names, His 99 names. When you want to answer the question, what does He want from us? You have to involve yourself on the path of ilm a knowledge. 
And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. To actualize Tawheed again is not just to say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. It's not just to recognize Him as the most merciful, the most gracious, the most merciful. It's, I'll take an incident from the life of Aisha and it will show us, inshallah, how actualizing Tawheed is something so much more than just a descriptive statement. When our mother Aisha was slandered, her father Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he was supporting someone financially who was one of the slanderers. When he found out that the person he was supporting financially was one of the slanderers, he didn't do anything to harm this person. All he did was stop his financial sustenance of this person. That's all he did. He was, and I, I want all of us to think about wrongs that have been done to us. I don't think any of us could imagine something as bad as someone slandering uh, your child, your daughter, slandering someone you love with something so despicable and so ugly. And yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a verse basically asking Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to forgive. Would he not like the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And in response to this verse, Abu Bakr changed his transaction. When he stopped the sustenance, he was allowing this other person to be the motivator of his behavior. He was letting the slanderer be the motivator of his behavior. But after he heard the verse, his behavior was motivated by Allah. His transaction was with Allah. And so he didn't just believe in the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made a transaction with it. And he forgave the person, not because they deserved it, but because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves forgiveness. So for us to actualize tawheed, it means that we are responding to the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our lives. That if we really knew al kareem we would be so generous. If we knew that all of what we have comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would not fear decrease in our wealth. And I heard a story recently about a young brother in the UK, in England, and all he had was 150 pounds to his name. He had no more money. It was the month of Ramadan. All of the money he had was 150 pounds. And he said, subhanAllah, he said that, the, you know, in the masjid that he was in, they were doing fundraising. And he thought to himself he should hold on to his money. And then he realized, what is 150 pounds going to do anyway? What is 150 pounds going to buy me from this world anyway? He said, it's like someone who has a toothpick in the middle of the ocean, and they're trying to hold on to the toothpick to try to save themselves. And he said, instead, just throw the toothpick away or donate this toothpick. Maybe you'll get a big ship that will show up and save you. And so he said, subhanAllah, something so inspiring. He said, I had to realize that the source of my risk was ar razaq And so I gave all of this money, but I gave it shaking because I still had this fear inside. And he said, as soon as I gave the money, he said, the, the, the floodgates of risk were poured upon him. This is someone who was responding to the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al kareem and not just in a descriptive way, but living with this name in his life. This is what tawheed really means. The name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ar-Rabb, that He is our Lord, should inspire sincerity. The name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Hamid, should inspire humility. Al-Haq, that we should always be of those who stand for truth and justice and integrity. Al-Alim, that we should never debase knowledge. We should never debase knowledge. We're living in times where you find interesting extremes with regards to scholars. You find those who put the scholar in a place as if they are infallible. They're sacred in and of themselves. People try to, you know, touch their clothing and get some barakah from being, you know, close to them. And then you have people who say, we don't need scholars. We can just make ijtihad ourselves. And both of these extremes are a big problem. Both of these extremes show that we do not respect the source of knowledge, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al-alim. I've heard someone say once, you know, I don't like to talk about ilm, I like to talk about fahm. Newsflash, 
How many times does the word ilm occur in the Quran and in the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam? If Allah didn't throw it out and the Prophet didn't throw it out, why are we so ready to throw this word out? You cannot have fahm without ilm. Knowledge is an essential part of our growth and our compass. Without knowledge, you cannot know which direction to go in. You cannot know how to tread your path. And we should be a people who care about what it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking of us. You know, it's not, again, the, for, for activists, for people who are involved in uh, different levels of Islamic work, fiqh matters. What the jurists say matters, their legal reasoning matters. I'm not saying take it blindly, be critical, but it matters. Scholars matter. Learning Islam for ourselves matters. It's the seventh principle of Imam Hassan al-Banna's 20 principles of, of understanding. And so to actualize Tawheed, I want us also to think about three very easy, I want to say, experiential things that we can do. Number one, as I mentioned before, with our actions, to always recognize that the transaction is with Allah. If I'm dealing with my spouse, my husband, or my, your wife, or your children, or your parents, or your boss, if you're dealing with Islamophobes, if you're dealing with fans, if you're dealing with critics, your action should be motivated in a, as a transaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This will bring out two things. One, ihsan. Because when you know that you're responding to Allah, you will respond in the best way. You leave the petty things behind. And number two, tawbah. You will seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will try to correct your wrongs because again, you know your transaction is with Allah. You're not begging for the scraps from the, you know, the table of this dunya. Number two, if you really want to actualize tawheed, I recommend to you to be in a state of dhikr as much as you can. To get out of the conversation inside your head and start talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead. It's a much healthier conversation, I promise you. Whatever your concerns are, whatever your fears are, whatever they are, start talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the course of your conversation, and this is called munajah, and it's also a form of dhikr, it will realign your compass because you are speaking to the one that your transaction is with. And the third is istikhara and dua, that when we are confused, when we, after we have searched through books of knowledge, after we have searched by talking to people and seeking shura, we need to be constant in our dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he keeps our compass directed in the best direction. Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qulubana ala deenik. O oh Allah, the one who is the turner of the hearts, make our hearts steadfast on your deen. This is, this is a dua the Prophet ﷺ used to make a lot, and he was the Prophet. And istikhara, which is to go to Allah for our direction in major decisions. He's not the last one, he's the first one. I know a sister who does this regularly. When she goes shopping, she, she makes a dua of istikhara. When she goes to a restaurant, she makes a dua of istikhara. She lives seeking her guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second theme is tazkiyah. And in the issue of tazkiyah, I want to talk about it more from a community perspective because I think on a personal level, it's something that, alhamdulillah, we try to take care of things uh, individually. You know, we try to uh, be involved in the reading of the Quran or we try to make istighfar. All of these things, alhamdulillah, are wonderful. But I when you look at our state as a community, that really is something that is a better indicator of how far our tazkiyah is going. So there's a documentary uh, that uh, one of the sisters that we know, uh, amazing sister, mashallah, and her husband, they produced called Unmasked. And something that's really profound about this documentary is that good people, good Muslims in America feel like they don't belong in our masajid. Now you could say, you know what, they need to be more patient. I know seven imams in the last year who resigned from their masajid. And these are not just, you know, uh, converts or people who are born here. These include immigrant imams. 
So it's not just the congregation that has become unmasked. It's also the imams themselves who are becoming unmasked. And that is something that we should be concerned about. There is a crisis in our masajid. I heard an imam say when he spends the entire day at the masjid, it's like being in a toxic environment. He can't wait to get home. This is a problem. Now, I'm not saying get rid of masajid. We definitely need to work on the culture that we are building in our masajid. We have to be ready to challenge things that go against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed or allowed for us. In our masajid, a lot of times what we do is because we don't want to rock the boat and we don't want to hurt donations, we don't make the necessary changes that are giving people their rights. The masjid should not be a hedge experience. And I, I hope you know what I mean when I say that. In hedge, it, there's a lot of difficulty. There's diversity, alhamdulillah, there are crowds. Everyone is sort of expecting when they go for hedge that this is going to be hard. I know people who have to prepare themselves mentally every time they go into a musalla that this is going to be hard. I don't know what's going to happen. That, that, that's a huge issue that points to a lack of true tazkiyah in our communities. And what I mean by that is if we uphold the legacy of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu the model of the prophetic masjid, and we apply it to our context here in America, we shouldn't be having these problems. Especially when it comes to women. Especially when it comes to women. I know sisters who say, when I go to the masjid, I'm getting attacked. And when I go out into the public you know, environment here, there's Islamophobes, I'm getting attacked. When I go to work, I have to defend myself. Everywhere I turn, I have to defend myself. Someone is telling me that I'm wrong all the time. Where do I go? That is not an environment that's going to cultivate faith. We have, I mean, I won't go into the issues in the documentary, but I will just say this. There's a story in the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that really uh, affected me when I read it. Basically, Ibn Abbas is narrating this. He says that there was a woman who was from her tribe, from the most beautiful of women. And she used to come to the Prophet's masjid and pray. And when she would come to pray, there were some men when they knew that she was there, they would pray in the front to get away from her. And there were some men who would go and pray in the back to try to take a peek at her in ruku' and sujood. And Allah revealed the verses that, and Allah knows the eager amongst you in the front, and Allah knows the eager amongst you in the back. Now, he's, he's mentioning this incident as sabab al nuzul for the ayah. The scholars agree that this ayah was revealed after the verses of hijab. So there was no wall, there was no curtain, there was no one telling this woman, go and pray in the back, you're, you know, you're too young or you're too pretty. There was no one who condemned her for being in that space. There was no one who looked at her and said, you don't belong here. What does Allah do? Allah tells the men, addresses the men, I know what you're doing. There is, Allah does not reprimand this woman. It is not her fault for being pretty. We have a problem with beauty in our community. We don't know how to understand it. So tazkiyah means that we go back again to our principles and go back to our values and uphold what we were given, the beautiful message that we were given from the Prophet Muhammad To this day, I believe women were more liberated in the prophetic society than they are today in our communities and our masajid, and that's a problem. Converts. I don't want to get into some of the stories that I hear from people who have accepted Islam and how they've been treated. But again, it's an indication that our values are in the wrong place. Our values are in the wrong place. If we actualize Tawheed, if we truly actualize Tawheed, it will do two things. One, we will make decisions that are principled. And when your decision is principled, you can never regret it. Number two, you will value the things that deserve to be valued. There's a story in Surah Al-Baqarah that I think is really relevant. The story of Talut. He was a leader that was chosen for his people by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he was a righteous person and Allah had increased him in knowledge and strength. But Bani Israel, many people from Bani Israel said, we don't want to accept Talut. 
because he's not from the rich and important amongst us. They wanted someone from an elite class to represent them. Their values were in the wrong place. One of the signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah is that people will choose bad leaders to lead them. Your values are in the wrong place. If you are choosing people because of wealth, if you are choosing people because of their class, if you are choosing people because of their accent, because of their race, because of their skin color, your values are in the wrong place. Tawheed means that we go back to the source of our values and we value things according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala values. And the last subject that I want to talk about in the short time I have left, if I have time, is this issue of Umran, civilization building. Now when it comes to being Muslims in America, we hear all the time, alhamdulillah, and especially within mass, we hear this, that we need to participate in this society, we need to better this country as American Muslims using our values. And again, in the words of Dr. Saeed Ramadan, our problem is a problem of spirituality. We can't start to affect change on the outside until the change has really occurred on the inside. One of the big changes that needs to happen is we need to care. Before we start talking about social justice, before we start talking about Black Lives Matter, I can't breathe, we need to truly care about these people because you cannot help a people you don't care about. And it's not just a hashtag thing on social media. We, when, when the things that have happened in this country that have happened to African Americans, when I started seeing this, I was waiting. I'm still waiting for a Muslim organization to carry this torch in our name and represent our contribution to this discussion in America. And this is not just for Dawah, it's because we need to care. We can't do things just to look good. It has to be prophetic. It can't be a political move. It has to be a prophetic move. This is who we are. We defend people when they're getting oppressed. It doesn't just have to be Muslims and Islamophobia. When African Americans are facing what they're facing in this country, we need to be the first people to stand up. The Prophet ﷺ, when he heard this verse in the Qur'an, he used to cry. The verse is, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا So how will it be when we bring forth from every nation a witness and we bring you over these people as a witness? He cried because he cared that he was a witness over mankind. And we are told in the Qur'an that we, that the Prophet was a witness over us and actually we are the witnesses to all the people after him. So civilization building is, act, is an expression of the love that we have for the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. that we will carry the torch that was passed on to us. I want to know how many people cried when they saw the images that they saw with Ferguson. How many people felt their hearts burn when they saw someone choking to death on video? We have to care the way the Prophet Muhammad cared. And that's the first place to start for civilization building. Something to take from the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad I'm going to read actually directly for you the stipulations of two pledges that were made. There's the pledge of Al-Aqaba, the first one. And there is the second pledge of Al-Aqaba, and I want you to notice the difference. The stipulations of the first pledge. We will not worship anyone but Allah. We will not steal, nor commit adultery, nor kill our children. We will not utter slander, intentionally forging falsehood. And we will not disobey you in any just matter. This is the first pledge. There were 12 men who took it. A year later, the second pledge. Very different, and I want you guys to again notice the difference in the second pledge. To listen and obey in all sets of circumstances. To spend in plenty as well as in scarcity. To enjoin good and forbid evil. In Allah's service, fear the blame of no one. To defend the Prophet in case he seeks your help and protect him from anything you protect yourself, your spouses, or your children from. 
The first pledge was about living Islam. And this was a mandatory pledge. The second pledge was not mandatory. Two of the companions told their people that you have a choice whether or not you're going to take this pledge. And if you can't uphold the conditions, then don't take it, because it will count against you to betray these conditions. The second pledge was recommended. But the Prophet ﷺ, he said about the second pledge, if you observe these conditions, paradise is in store for you. The second pledge is about living for Islam. And we have people in our community who want to live Islam, but they don't want to live for Islam. And we have people in our community who want to live for Islam, but they don't want to live Islam. And for us to truly be a people who contribute to the building of our civilization, we have to uphold both pledges. We have to want to uphold both. I want to live Islam and I want to live for Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that from the believers there are people who are true to their pledges with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the believers there are people who are true to their pledge. If you want your compass to head in the right direction, I'm asking everyone here today to don't leave the Mass Ikna Convention 2014 without making a personal pledge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A personal pledge that takes into account your, your life circumstances on how you will live for Islam and how you will live Islam. And I end with a beautiful story of a sheikh, and I've said this before at this convention, but a, a, a wonderful example never gets old. It's the story of Sheikh Abdul Muta'al al-Jabri. Uh, when he was very ill, he's an Azhari sheikh, he came from Egypt and he was always, mashallah, someone who was involved in the da'wah. When he was sick and he was in the hospital, he was unable to move. And there's an Ammu who's telling me the story. There's an uncle and he said, I went to go visit him in the hospital. And I could see him through his hospital door. And he had his hand above his head and he was going like this. He was clenching his fist. So he thought something must be wrong. So he rushes to Sheikh Abdul Muta'al al-Jabri and he asks him, is there anything I can get you? And he says, no, it's just a long time ago, I made a pledge to Allah that I would exercise every day to keep my body healthy in his service. And today, the only thing I can move is my hand. So I'm exercising my hand. I'm upholding my pledge to Allah. And so I, this, this is an example that really touched me, subhanAllah. And I'm asking every one of you, not just to admire the example, but to make a pledge. What will your pledge be? Whatever I, Jazakumullah khair, and whatever I said that was beneficial is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and whatever is wrong and mistaken is from myself and the shaitan.